The 2024 Olympics have begun in Paris, and it's one of the most sustainable modern Olympics yet. Mostly because the games are utilizing existing stadiums to carry out the majority of the events, and only four new venues had to be built, one of them being the new Aquatic Center. Compare this to the most recent World Cup in Qatar, where the opposite occurred, and seven new stadiums were built, with only one old stadium being reused. Now, these two events are not perfectly compatible for comparison. Both cities have vastly different histories and development, but I only bring it up to make the point that stadiums are expensive and costly, both for our wallets and for the air that we breathe. Hi, my name is Matt. If you're new to this channel, I like doing engineering and design deep dives, and today I want to talk about one of the major new venues they constructed for the games, the Paris Aquatic Center. And I'll talk about it both structurally and in the context of one of the most sustainable Olympics ever. So Paris attempting to brand itself as a sustainable Olympic host, they were able to reuse many of its existing stadiums and only needed a few additional venues to accommodate events like diving, synchronized swimming, climbing, badminton, and rowing. Many of the existing venues were built in the 2000s or the 1980s, with a handful of historic stadiums or reuse projects coming from the 1930s. Out of the 27 or so number of venues used, only four are permanent new constructions, including the Aquatic Center. Five of them are temporary structures that will be dismantled later, such as the Eiffel Tower Arena, and two of them are adaptive reuse projects, such as the Grand Palace where you can go and watch fencing, or the North Paris Arena where you can go and watch boxing. Most of these venues reside inside or within Paris itself, but seven large stadiums all around France are used to share the requirement for the football space needed. While it's a very good talking point to say that the largest permanent venue built for the games is relatively small in comparison, but it's also worth noting that seven of the existing structures were all built within the past decade, which isn't exactly very sustainable of Paris to be building so much so recently, but I could go back and forth on this for a while. The design of the new Aquatic Center was done by the Hoven CS Architecture and the structure by Schleich Bergemann Partner, and its form closely follows the environmental and functional constraints prescribed to it. So let's start with its main function, for swimming and diving. We have a pool on this end and a diving area on this end. We need enough space over here for the divers to jump and do their thing. Then we don't need as much over here for the synchronized swimmers, so it makes sense to have the roof profile follow this general curve here. Now the next most important point besides giving the athletes a room to perform is giving the audience a view to see them. So if we roughly draw on the eyesight of the top of the stands to the area of the divers, we get this nice concave shape. And because this space would have been heated if it were enclosed with the pool, the roof was designed to follow this shape and eliminate the dead space near the ceiling. Now, how do our environmental constraints factor into this? If we focus on reducing the amount of carbon dioxide pumped into the atmosphere, we can look at our carbon emissions and split it into two categories, our operational carbon and our embodied carbon. The operational carbon is the carbon emissions associated throughout the lifetime of the building. For example, the carbon associated with running the heaters or the AC or the lighting or just the regular maintenance of the building. Those are all dependent on the systems used to maintain the building and can be carefully designed for. Then there's the embodied carbon, which is how much carbon it takes to construct the building. Or you can kind of view it as the carbon cost of the building. So if you have a concrete building, this is the carbon emitted in the kiln process. Or for the steel, it's the carbon emitted by firing up the furnace. Or if you prefabricate things, it's how much carbon is emitted by the planes, boats, and trains to transport it to site. It both feels simple in the decision-making process, but carbon is emitted at every single step, so it takes a lot of design intent from the start to really reduce the emissions going into the building. The embodied carbon is why the reuse of existing venues is very sustainable, because the venues have already expensed CO2 costs for construction, and it's only the operational carbon that needs to be accounted for. If I look at all the venues for the Olympics, and I use stadium capacity as a proxy for the stadium size, and then thus the CO2 emissions, we can plot out how much CO2 we expect to be emitted in 5-year cycles. I'm going to also multiply the temporary structures by a factor of 0.8. I don't have any specific precedent for doing this, I'm just going to assume that a temporary structure will likely have less concrete, and therefore it'll just be more sustainable naturally. So looking year to year, the 2024 Paris Games occur in the last 5 year chunk, and its estimated CO2 emissions is relatively low in comparison. The decade prior from 2010 to 2020, however, has a lot of CO2 emissions associated with it. So this highlights a contradiction I was talking about earlier, where the Olympics themselves are very sustainable by reusing all these stadiums, but this is following the most recent CO2 intensive construction cycle to get to this point. So maybe it's a good thing like Paris is investing in their infrastructure and they don't have to emit this CO2 for many years or decades to come. But also if we bring up the Qatar World Cup again, this was largely criticized as a very unsustainable move because seven new stadiums were built from nothing. But now if Qatar hosts the games again in 2030 or whatever, it can also be labeled as the most sustainable World Cup ever because they don't need to do any more new construction going forward. Anyways, this is all besides the point and just to highlight how relative the term sustainable can be used and why it's really important to zero in on the specific design decisions that make a design sustainable. So back to the aquatic center. We have the curvature of the roof derived by building the roof as close to the constraints as possible. 
This helps to reduce the amount of operational carbon because the heating demands are now reduced to their minimum, so our functional and environmental goals are working hand in hand. Recently in 2020, Paris passed a law requiring all new construction structures to use 50% timber as a resource. This was done before the Olympics and has led to an increase in timber construction since, which is largely viewed as a highly sustainable construction material because cut down trees can be replaced and the growth of new trees will then sequester new CO2 from the atmosphere. This CO2 is then stored within the wood until the end of its life when it's either burnt or decomposes or whatever happens. So the cycle of the construction has this new sequestration of CO2 built into it, while the CO2 cost of the timber is stored in the material until the end of its life, thus also offsetting the emissions associated with timber as well, which is another added benefit. So timber was the obvious choice for the roof design, and this curvature already has some built-in structural benefits that aided in its implementation. Looking in this view, the roof swoops down in what closely resembles a catenary curve. A catenary curve is a shape that a chain makes when hanging under its own self-weight, and it's widely recognized as one of the most material efficient shapes. You'll notice this is the same shape that an arch makes, it's just upside down. If we look at how a roof supports a single point load at its center, if the beams are all flat, then the roof is going to have to bend to resist that load. Bending is a very expensive force because it requires a thick section that's rigid enough. If the roof is in the catenary shape, however, we have our point load, we can see that some of the beam actually has an axial force moving through it that can resist this load upwards and lift the point load up. This means that there's not as much bending going on in this section, and therefore it's a little bit more material efficient. As an oversimplification, if there's no axial load path through the beam, the force will move by bending the member. If there's an axial load path provided, then the member won't have to bend as much to resist this. I could go into much more depth about this topic, but I will save that for a catenary shape specific video so I don't get too sidetracked. Um, so we have the catenary shape of the roof here that follows our functional constraints for the venue. The structural system is composed of these large roof pylons which are pinned to the ground and hold the roof up. To stabilize these pylons from tilting inwards with the roof, there are these thin tensile rods that hold down each section and give the timber roof some extra support at the end. To prevent the pylons from falling to the side on each other, a wood stiffening truss runs at the top level and braces each of the pylons against one another. This links all the pieces together and helps the roof act a little bit more like a single membrane, despite being made up of individual beams. You can think of the stiffening truss and all these little stiffening elements as adding rigidity between a series of playing cards. Each card is individually designed to carry its own weight efficiently, but it only acts in one plane. If we stop our structural design here, then all the cards will fall down, but if we stiffen them with small connections between, or by a truss at either end, we can fully utilize the strength of each card without any fear that the structure will top over and lose stability. A wood facade is added between the timber elements, both on the roof and in between the pylons, and additional cable bracing is added to hold the facade against them. As any project that aims for sustainability, the facade is minimal and the structural form itself is embraced as the aesthetic value of the design, which, as somebody in structural engineering, is usually my favorite type of design. Other sustainable features include a rainwater collection system on the sloped roof and a solar farm on top that provides roughly 20% of the building's operating energy. It also sports a flexible pool design that lets it be used for a number of events depending on what's needed. If you would like to read more about the building, my two primary sources were the architect Verhoeven CS Architecture's website and the engineer Schleich Bergman Partners website. You can read more about each of the venues on the Olympics website, and I also found some good design information from this article by Reba Journal and Architectural Digest. And you can also look at this article from Wood Central for more about the timber component of the building. If you enjoyed this video, like and comment and let me know. Otherwise, subscribe for more videos like this in the future. Thanks for watching.